<laughs> so, Waking, up, <laughs> Waking them up. Amen. All right, Philippians chapter number one. Ah, good to be in church, isn't it? It's good to be here. Um, so we are uh, teaching through Philippians, preaching through Philippians here. Uh, the different men are, are uh, going through different books and things. This is the one that preacher asked me to preach through. Uh, and it's a fantastic, it's a wonderful book. It's all about um, joy and joy in the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of uh, things that are going wrong. Look at verse number 12. Uh, he's in jail here when he says this. I would that ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the fur furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Paul was someone who was really, I mean, he had, he had an optimistic uh, air to him, didn't he? Yeah. He, was, he was just, I, I love reading Paul because he's like in jail. He's like, I... I don't want you to think that this is something bad that's happening to me because it's, it's fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. That is, being in this prison, I've gotten to preach to people who are in jail, he says. That's a, that's a blessing. And there's, there's always a way to be able to look on, uh, on, on and have some thankfulness, like Preacher was talking about this morning, preaching about this morning, have some thankfulness for what God's doing, uh, even when it doesn't seem like it's good, thanking him for the good that he's bringing out of those uh, bad things. Um, so let's go ahead, but that's, I'm going to back up just a little bit, and we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, look at verse number 9. It says, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Manning, would you open us in prayer, please? Well, thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. So what we're, we're going through this and one thing that I've noticed um, in reading the, you know, the letter, Paul's letters and the, the epistles is that often you may have noticed this too. Have you ever been reading his epistles and noticed that he kind of he opens each one with a prayer for the people that he's writing to? Have you noticed this? He says, I pray that this and this and I pray that this and this or pray that this and this. So I'd like to go through and do a study tonight on Paul's prayers for the people that he has written these letters to. So we're going to go through each letter, maybe not all of them, I kind of group some of them together. We're going to go through each letter and see what it is that he's praying for, for these people that he's writing these epistles to, and see if we can learn from Paul's example. He said, he said follow me as I follow Christ, right? So we'll see if we can learn something about prayer and about how we can pray and some different ways to pray from Paul's example of prayer. All right? Amen. Amen. Sound good? So... Uh, look at verse number 9. He says, This I pray that your love abounds more and more. Look over at Romans chapter number 8. Let's dig into this just a little bit. So uh, the, what we're going to talk about tonight, of course, is not all about prayer. This is not some type of a message where I'm trying to get everything that there is to say about prayer. That would, There's been volumes written on that. If you want to read a good book or a good set of books on prayer, if you're, you'd like to work on your prayer life a little bit, um, there's a book, good set of, a collection of books by a man named E.M. Bounds. And that uh, collection is just on prayer. You can look up E.M. Bounds on prayer, and it's a thick volume. There's three or four books on it, and he goes into all kinds of different things on prayer. If, you've, if you'd like to try to increase that in your spiritual life, I would highly recommend uh, that volume. It's a really, you can get it on audiobook. You can listen to it as you're driving down the road. It's very, very good. Um, so I, I would highly recommend that. Um, but, it's, but 
I don't want to just be up here and say and, and give the impression that there's some type of technical, this is how you pray, pray for this and this and this and this and this. Because prayer ought to be something that is natural for a Christian. It really is, is if you want to know, are you in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, are you praying? You're not, you're, you're not in fellowship with God if you're not praying to him. Uh, that's, just the, that's just the case. There's a, if you've got someone... Let's say you're in a, um, you know, you've got a, you're a young person, you've got a roommate, and that roommate doesn't talk to you ever. They just kind of leave messages for you here and there, and they'll say, you know, leave, take the dishes out, put, put the dishes out, or, you know, your rent is due or something, and then you talk to them one day and say, well, why don't you ever, why don't you ever talk to me? Why don't we ever have any conversations? And their reply is, well, you know, I just, whenever I talk to you, my mind kind of drifts off. And I don't really get anything out of it, and I feel like it's kind of boring, and I don't know what to... How would you feel about that roommate saying that to you? So, you know, you'd say that you're not really, you don't have a really good relationship with them. And maybe you should have, you know, work on that relationship a little bit. So, I, I know that there's this sense that, well, you know, talking to God can be, my mind can drift off and all this, but let's, let's dig a little deeper on that. It is work, and it is a discipline to be able to do that. Um, but it's something that I think that, that you can work on. But look at verse number, uh, verse number 15. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse number 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, because preacher is preaching on the fear of the Lord, I want to touch on this really quickly here because you look at this and say, well, there are, there are verses that say we're not supposed to fear um, the, you know, perfect love casteth out fear, all that. Uh, what, what does he mean when he says, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption? Look up a few verses here. The bondage that he's talking about is the bondage towards the flesh to do, this, to, to, to do the works of the flesh. And the fear is the fear of, the, uh, of death as a result of that bondage. Look over at Hebrews chapter number 2, and you'll see it laid out really clearly here. I just don't want you to get the impression that this verse is going against anything the preacher is saying here. This is not the fear that he's talking about. The fear of God is absolutely fundamental and primary to a Christian life as, as he's been preaching. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15. It says, and to deliver them, and verse number 14, you're seeing about salvation there. 15, deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So there is a bondage to the law because they're fearing death. Bondage to do this or to do that because there's, you're fearing death. That's what he's talking about. Now back at Romans chapter 8, look at verse 15. I'll hit this part that I want to talk about here. Romans 8 verse 15, it says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption. Can you imagine for a moment... Um, not having, not knowing who your father is or your mother is, and then, and then being adopted, and all of a sudden getting a family, and a family that really loves you, and that loves you more than you ever thought any, any family could love you. That spirit of adoption, that, that's what we have when we get saved. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. That spirit of adoption, that's what we've received. That spirit of adoption, look what it says, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We cry, Abba, Father. So, that there's, there's something natural, just like just as natural as a young child wanting to talk to their dad. You should want to have that, 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 that desire to talk to your heavenly father. Um, I, I remember there was one time I, I, was, uh, I was watching TV, sitting upstairs watching TV, and Sophie came out. Sophie was a little kid at the time, and she came out and she said, Dad, she asked a question about Greek, about the Greek New Testament. What, what does this mean, this Greek, you know, why, the, the originals are in Greek, and why do some of the new translations do this? And do you even remember this? And so the, why do some of the new translations do this, and what's the Greek behind it and everything? And I'm like, oh, this is great. I love to talk about this. I took three years of Greek in school. No one cares or wants to hear about this. I suffered for no reason. It's like the, I just, it was, it was uh, character building, they say, right? Um, so, but 
someone asked me about Greek, I'm all in talking about it because I feel like I get to use those three years of, so I'm like, sit down, Sophie, I'll talk to you all about this. So we went through it and I pulled up some stuff on the screen and here's some, you know, I went through like these, these, this Greek text versus that Greek text and this one and showed her like how this one had removed this word and that's why the new versions removed this word and all over and she's talking, she's like, yeah, this is really, yeah, that's interesting. We're going back and forth. And then I, towards the end, after you know, a good 15 or 20 minutes of talking about it, I, I said, what is it that made you ask this question? Like, what is it that, like, was there somebody at school that, that said that to you? Or what, why are you interested in this? And she said, oh, I just wanted to talk to you, Dad. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. And that's just, that's a natural Thing. Your, your kids, they want to come talk to you. You want to come talk to your dad. You want, there's that spirit of adoption. There's that spirit of, of family. It's like, hey, can we just sit down and talk? You know, let's just sit down and talk. Have it sitting across for the, the table um, from, your, from some family and just, you know, you, Thanksgiving ought not to be something we dread. It ought to be something we can say, man, it's a blast to be able to get together with family, with people that we love. Maybe it's not a family, you know, by blood. Maybe it's some church family you can sit down with and have have a meal with, but isn't it a blessing to be able to have some family like that, be able to have a conversation. You know, when there, there's, a, there's a desire in you to talk to God, Amen. and I would just, just move towards that. Yeah. Just, just open your mouth and talk to Him, Amen. you know? And, and I'm not, I don't want to make this study so like mechanical or technical that you're like, well, I've got to do this or this or this, or I've got to say this or this. No, it ought to be just as natural as talking to your Heavenly Father. Now, I like this, and I can't avoid saying it. I've said it here before when we sing that song. Um, what's the song we sing uh, that says Abba Father? Uh, Father, Abba, Father, cry. Arise, my soul, arise. Right? He says, and Father, Abba, Father. I've mentioned it before. But I heard somebody say, somebody say one time that Abba is spelled the same way backwards and, fo and forwards. You notice that A, B, B, A, spelled the same backwards and, and forwards. And God is your father, and you want to talk to him whether you're backwards or whether you're forwards with him. And if you, when you're close to God, you want to talk to him. And when you're far from God, you want to talk to him. Get close. It's, God, I need to talk to you about this. I'm far from you. And that's good. That's a good thing. Um, so let's talk about this a little. Let's, let's dig into this and see how Paul is going through this here. Let's look, look back at Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to touch just really quickly on the different places in the, different, in the beginnings of the epistles here. And we'll see what we can learn from this. Philippians chapter 1. What are some different things that we can learn from Paul that will help us to not just say the same thing over and over? You know, you get in prayer and you pray the same thing over and over. And it's like, well, I'm just, Lord, thank you for the food. Thank you for this day. Thank you, you know, that's it. Just saying the same thing and pray for the preacher and pray for his wife and pray for the church and pray for it. And we get kind of a little bit rote and a little bit kind of mechanical in that. So there's a few different things you can get. Maybe you say, well, I didn't think to pray for that. Well, I didn't think to pray for this. Maybe we can kind of think to pray for some different things as Paul lays it out here. You'll notice they're spiritual things. Chapter 1, verse 9. This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. So at the beginning of the letters here, he prays for the things that he's teaching them. He's praying for the things that he's teaching them. What you'll see, if you want to know what, what a letter is about, Look at the prayer, and he prays in about three sentences what he's about to teach them in about three chapters. That's what's happening here. So if you read the book of Philippians, and then you go back and read the prayer at the beginning, you'll say, oh, he was praying. He prayed this, and then he goes and he teaches them what it is. But he prays for it. So in this right here, for example, he's going to pray about knowledge and judgment and approving things um, that are excellent sincere and without offense, he's about to go into that in detail throughout the book of Philippians, but he prays for it at the beginning. Now, we get a lot of teaching and preaching here at our church. How much are you praying about it? How much are you praying about it? Now, I know you can come to the altar and pray about it afterwards, but I'd encourage you to pray about those things. Maybe write down something as God gives it to you. God gives you something. Write it down on a little note, stick it in your pocket, and then pick it up later and say, Lord, I want to pray about this thing that I've been learning. How much have you prayed for the fear of the Lord throughout the past few weeks? Amen? Amen. Say, so, well, Brother Sam, I, my prayer life is getting a little dull. I'm praying the same thing over and over again. Well, you're hearing something different every week. 
pick it up, put it in your pocket, pray for it throughout the day. Pray, Lord, Lord, help me to understand what the fear of the Lord is. Help me to think about the judgment and not and, and how and how I'll, I'll be judged for these things, like He preached about this morning. Right? Praying for those things, praying for what it is that you're learning about. It's a blessing because, you know, we don't have to learn it on our own without the Lord's help. Judah uh, has a tutor at the house, and uh, Judah, he's got somebody who comes by every Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever. It's a teacher, and she comes and sits at the kitchen table, and she teaches him math. You say, well, Sam, why don't you do that? I don't know how to do it. I, my, I don't understand Judah's math. He's way past me. It's in seventh grade or whatever. You know, he's, he's way past me at this point. I don't know. The way they do math these days is very, very difficult. There's a strange thing. Yes, I know how to do math. Okay, I'm not... I know how to do math. I don't know how to do that math. Um, I'll, I, I tried to help him once, and he failed the homework. It was just, it was terrible. I'm like, this is, this is, this is it. No, that's not it. So we got, a, we got someone who knew what they were doing, someone who knew the textbook backwards and forwards and could sit down with them week after week and teach them. And his grades have gotten really, really good. Really good. Congratulations, buddy. Really good grades. <laughs> Um, and, and it's because he worked at it, but you know what? He had someone who knew the textbook sitting right next to him when he read it. And you have the same thing with God. You don't have to sit here and say, well, I don't understand what I'm reading. Pray. Ask the Lord to help you with what you're reading. Lord, will you please teach me what this means? Will you please open it up to me? Because when you sit down, this is the only book that when you sit down, the author of the book sits down next to you every single time you open it up. The author sits down next to you while you're reading this book. And if there's something that you don't understand, you can say, hey, author, will you explain to me what you meant by this? And he'll give you some insight into that. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. So use that to your advantage. Sit down and pray. And while you're reading your Bible in the morning, pray, Lord, help me, guide me, show me what it is that, I, that you want me to learn from this. So what is it? Let's get into some more detail here. This I pray, verse number nine, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent. So um, he's praying here for the Philippians. In this particular case, he's praying for discernment. And it may be that uh, if you haven't prayed for this yet, maybe, maybe we should be praying for discernment. That is discerning uh, what it is that we ought to love, what it is that we ought not to love. Now, this is a big deal. Look, what, look at what he says. He says, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more, and a lot of new agers or worldly people will cut that sentence off right there and say, we ought to love more and more. We ought to just love. Love is love, and love is the greatest, and all you need is love, and love it all. Right? You see that. And this is where the LGBTQ crowd and all this has gone. They'll have a sign that says love is love, and they'll look through the Bible until they find a verse that says love one another, and they'll put it up here, and they'll say, you should love me because the Bible says love. In general, love, right? Finish the verse. Look at what it says. That your, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. He wants you to love with judgment, with discernment. I'm not saying judge other people like harshly, like, you know, walk up to them and you're a jerk. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you ought to be able to judge what it is that we're loving and what it is that you're not loving. The Bible says love not some things, does it? Uh, they, they, they love to put the LGBT crowd, like, and this is for a, a bunch of young people because older folks, y'all know that this is wrong, but younger folks are getting washed in this stuff. They're getting absolutely bombarded with this. And I'll tell you, they, they, will, they love to pull passages out that say, love this and love everything. But there are all kinds of scripture that says, love not. Yes. Love not the world, it says, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Love not those things. There are some things that you're not supposed to love. See, that sounds like anathema, doesn't it? Oh, we're not, we're supposed to love everything and everybody. Not according to the Bible. And Paul says that I pray that you'll know, you'll have some, you'll have some, some smarts about you. You'll have some discernment about the things that you should love and the things that you shouldn't love because it's difficult to know what you should and shouldn't love. That's something that can be kind of involuntary. That's something that you can just look at something and fall in love with it. Right? Yeah. If you just turn your brain off, turn your discernment off, you can just fall in love with whatever you see that looks beautiful according to the world. Right? 
So you've got to be careful with what you love. It says, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Why? That you may approve things that are excellent. And sincere, look at what he says, and without offense till the day of Christ. So he's saying, I want you at the judgment seat of Christ, at the rapture, I want you to be able to be without offense, sincere. I want you to be approving things that are excellent, not approving things that are not excellent. Look over at Psalm chapter 139. We'll see uh, one more piece on this. And preacher mentioned this this morning when he was preaching. Psalm 139. I think this is the passage that says, yes, search me, O God, know my heart, try me and know my thoughts. Verse 23, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. He didn't say, God, you know, love me the way that I am. I was born this way and love me the way that I am. No, he said, search me and see if there's anything I need to change. Um, and look at verse number 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. Do not I, am, am, am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Do you see it? Now that doesn't mean you're supposed to be a jerk to them because you know what the Bible says about our enemies. Pray for them. Uh, it says love your enemies. How do you love someone who's your enemy when it says hate your enemy? Well, you better know how to do that. You better have discernment on how to show love to somebody where the Bible says that you're supposed to hate, uh, hate and also love at the same time. Amen. If you give someone the gospel, you love them. If you're praying for them, you love them. If you show them some kindness, you love them. But if you uh, see that they're uh, sinning, they're living in sin, they're doing things that are, they're, that are the, towards the enemy of God, you better, you, better, you better have some hatred there. You better say, I'm, I'm backing off of this. I'm not going to draw affection towards this person. I'm not going to allow my heart to have this affection for this person that is, that is, is you don't have to be affectionately drawn towards somebody who is an enemy of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. See, it sounds, it sounds very wrong in, with the way that the world talks about love, doesn't it? It really does. Um, but this is, uh, this, this, lo knowing what to love and what to hate this discernment is what leads to verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. This discernment leads to holiness. This is what leads to being able to say, well, I, I'm walking according to the way that God wants me to walk in my life. This is what helps to drive this holiness here. Look back over at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, verse number 11. He prays, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So because of this prayer and because of this, this discernment, you ought to be praying that God will show some fruits of righteousness in your life. Fruits of righteousness. That is, this is there ought to be some things that are happening good as a result of, the, of your holiness. Now that doesn't mean your life is going great and everything is wonderful. He's about to say in the very next verse, I'm in jail. <laughs> Right? But what he said was, I'm in jail and people are getting saved. People are hearing the gospel. Don't think just because of the outward circumstances that this is not working out right. God is working this out right. But the fruits of righteousness for Paul were not that he was rich and lived in a big house and drove a fancy car or chariot. It was that he was able to see some people getting the gospel. That was the fruits of righteousness for Paul. So are there fruits of righteousness in your own life? That is, what's the fruit of right? That's, you're doing right, you're living right, you're acting right, and it's producing some good results. You know, your relationships are better as a result of it. Um, you know, you're getting some friends that you didn't have before. You know, you ought not to be the type of person that no one wants to be around because you've, you're disobeying. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And if you have this smell around you all the time of I'm just a jerk, um, that's not a fruit of righteousness. That's a fruit of unrighteous, unrighteousness, disobedience. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. All right, so you ought to have some results as, as, uh, as uh, you know, coming from this. So this, just this prayer, the very act of coming to God in prayer is going to help to produce some fruits of righteousness in you. It's going to help to produce some holiness. Now, isn't it true that just coming to God in prayer helps you just to get right with him? 
It's really difficult to just to be to, to have a good prayer life, a good consistent prayer life where you're waking up every morning and you're praying to God and then just get really, really far away from God. It's really easy to get far away from God pretty quickly. You put the, put the prayer away. But that getting in prayer is going to help you with that holiness. It's going to help you there. And I'm not saying it's, you're going to be perfect as a result of it, not by any stretch of the imagination. But you'll see some of those fruits when you develop that prayer life. Okay, so that's like, uh, just as an illustration, you remember the priest in the Old Testament going in before God? And when he went in before God, he went and looked at his reflection in the, uh, in the laver there, in the brazen laver there. And he saw, was, he saw what needed to be fixed before he went in there. Just going before the throne room of God helps you to see what needs to be fixed about yourself. Gets you a little more straightened out than you would have been if you, if you hadn't approached the throne of God. Amen. Look over at Ephesians chapter number 1. We're going to talk about that. I'll close with that um, in just a minute here. But uh, Ephesians chapter 1. So that's Philippians 1. He's praying for all these things for the Philippians. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. And we'll hit these things pretty quickly here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 16 and 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you. So here is Paul praying a prayer of thanksgiving, making mention of you in my prayers. What is Paul praying about for the Ephesians? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He's praying their eyes will be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of, this, of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Don't you love reading the Bible? I could just read this whole passage uh, for you here. What is he saying? He's saying that I am praying that you will know what God is working in you through the power of the resurrection towards heaven. You're working towards eternity. And I'm praying that you'll see that God is working on you towards that eternal glory. That's what God's doing. So you can pray that, that God will give you um, a, a long look at his work in you. Because if you look at just what's going on today, you may say, I am failing miserably. But if you zoom out a little bit and see the big picture, you'll see God is working something in me that may not show up till glory. But it may not show up till here. But you may look back on 10 years of a Christian life or 15 years of a Christian life and say, okay, I'd be in a whole lot bigger of a mess and God is doing something in me that he wasn't. You know, Brother Matt, I heard a story that, about you fishing one time. And I heard a story about how you learned to fish. I'm going to tell this story. I didn't ask him if I could beforehand, but this is a, easy, this is a simple story. Um, I heard that you had a book and a fishing book. Okay, and what you did is that you went out and you fished one spot and then you wrote the notes in a book. What you did. Do you remember this even? Don't remember the book. Okay, this is true. You told me. Okay. Um, maybe it was a fish story. Okay, this is, this, is, this is what you told me. So he wrote what it was uh, that they learned from this spot in this book. This per and, and, and then he, they went and fished another spot and wrote it in a book. And then went and fished another spot and wrote that down, fished another spot and wrote this down. And I imagine that there are many days that he went out and fished and caught nothing. Right? So if he was just focused on that one day of fishing, you go out and you have a bad day fishing, and that is a bummer. I mean, it's, it's rough. They say a bad day fishing is better than a good day at work. I, okay, that's true, but it's still no fun. <laughs> at some point, if you're not catching anything, you throw a shrimp in the bottom and you pull up anything, any fish, right, just to get the skunk off the boat. That's the way that it goes. But, but I imagine he had lots of days where he wrote that book, Fished this spot, caught nothing. And he just went out there and fanned this, this, uh, this, this shell rake or whatever it was. So it caught nothing. Moved the boat up a little bit the next day or next week. Fished this spot, caught nothing. Moved the boat up a little bit. Fished this spot, caught two reds and two trout. Right? If he was looking at that one day of fishing, he might say, I'm a failure as a fisherman. But I'll tell you what. After he's all done, he has a book of knowledge. That, and, and this man is a good fisherman as a result of it. And I'm sure you don't even need the book anymore. <laughs> you don't have it. You don't even remember it. You don't need it. Go out and find, if he can find the fish, he's got to a point where 
years of doing that, week after week and month after month of doing that, turned him into a good fisherman. So he wasn't going out there. What I'm saying is he wasn't going out there on any one particular day and trying to just say, I'm just out here to catch fish today. He was going out there to grow as a fisherman and to learn as a fisherman and to say, five years from now, I'm going to know this area. In 10 years from now, I'm going to be really good. In 15 years from now, I ought to be able to be a charter captain if I wanted to. That's what he's looking. He's got the long look. When he's writing that in the book, he's got, he's got the long look. And that's what, that's, that's what Paul prays for here. He prays that you will have the long look. Not the miserable, tough time you're having today, but what is God doing for you right now and through you right now in this difficulty for the judgment seat of Christ? What is he doing for glory? What is he making you into in the long run? That's what he's saying. Now, I, now what, you, what I'm saying is you've got to pray that the Lord will show this to you. You've got to pray because it's very easy. I mean, day to day, you're just looking at today. You've got to pray when you get started to get frustrated, Lord, help me to see the big picture here. Help me to see what you're doing in this so that I don't quit early and without seeing that I'm about to just break through this wall and get to, this, to these diamonds that you've got waiting for me in glory. I'm going to keep on even though this looks like dirt all around me right now. See? So pray that God will give you that vision. Pray that God will give you that eternal look. Okay? Uh, Colossians chapter number 1. That's what he's praying for in Ephesians. Colossians chapter 1. Are you with me still? Amen. Hold thou thy words before my sleeping eyes. <laughs> Not yet, right? Not quite yet. I, think, I feel like I've got you for a few more minutes before you start dozing off on me. Philippians, Colossians chapter 1. Isn't it a blessing to be able to go through the Bible and just learn just from pieces here and there, pick up things like that. It's what, you know, it's like preachers have been preaching through here. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 9. It says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. There it is again, the beginning of the letter. He's praying for you. Paul, what are you praying for the Colossians? To desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Young people, if you're in high school, underline this verse. You, you ought to be praying to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father. So he's praying here mainly that, they'll, that they will know the will of God and that they'll have the strength to be able to do the will of God once they find that out. So uh, what the, one of the biggest questions you get from teenagers over and over and over again is, you know, Brother Sam, how can I know the will of God? How can I know the will of God? You've been a youth pastor for a long time. You hear people, young people asking you that? Say, Brother Sonny, how can I know the will of God? Right? What do you tell them? I don't know. <laughs> you just, right? You better pray for it. You better get close to the Lord and you better pray. And I'll pray for you as well that God will give you an understanding of what the will of the Lord is and that when he starts to show it to you that you'll have the strength to be able to do it. So older folks in here, we ought to be praying for these younger people that are looking for God's will. We ought to be praying for each other that, we're looking, that they're, they're looking for God's will. Praying for our, our preacher. What's, what's God's will in this church? We've got a big building going up here. What's God's will in this? Praying that God will show him what his will is in moving into this building and give him the strength to be able to do that. What's God's will with the situation with Mrs. Peacock? What's God's will with the situation with Brother Richard? And how can we have the strength to be able to fulfill God's will? You can pray for it. So when's the last time you pray that you'd be able to do God's will in your, over the, you know, this next week? God, help me to see what your will is this week. Amen. And give me the strength to be able to do whatever it is that your will is. Amen. Amen? Some extra things to be able to pray for. Look over at 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. He starts 1 Corinthians with a prayer. Let's see what he says there. First Corinthians 1, and I'll start reading in verse number 4. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you that you come behind in no gift, he says, first of all, his prayer here is he's thanking God on their behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you're enriched in, by him, in utterance and knowledge. 
Do y'all know what, what Paul's about to do in the book of Corinthians? He's about to really lay into these, to this church for the carnality that they've got going on there. Yet at the beginning, that's why I say Paul is, the optimism here is amazing. He doesn't start and say, when I pray for you, you know, I, when I think of you and I pray for you, I say, Lord, why did you saddle me with these nasty Gentiles? <laughs> Lord, do you see what they are doing? You know, Jonah, do you, did you see what they are doing? How could you send me? Can you just shut it down and we'll start somewhere else? No, he still has some thanks that he's able to do for, that he's able to give to God for these people. What is he, what is he thankful for? That you're enriched by him. The, the, the Corinthians were enriched by God? Yes. In spite of how much of a mess the church was, they were better off than they would have been without God's grace. How about that for some prayer for grace, or for some prayer for thanks? Because you can look at your life and say, man, I am a mess. I am a mess. And if you're not careful, you'll sit through the preaching here and you'll just be like down on yourself. Man, I, I can't get this thing right. And every time I think I'm making a progress, there's another thing I gotta do. I'm, I got, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'm, and you get discouraged and you can get downtrodden. And you can get defeated, yeah. feel defeated. Being thankful to God in prayer will help with that. Amen. Taking some time and thanking God for what he's done in you and how he has grown you over the years and over time and how he's continuing to work on you like that song that says the kids sing, he's still working on me. Spending some time to be thankful can really help you not to be defeated with that. Um, I'm coaching Judah's baseball team, and we uh, lost a game the other day, and it was, it was rough. We played a doubleheader yesterday. That's why I'm a little sunburned today. It was yesterday, right? Saturday? Yeah. The days blur together, don't they? Yes. So Saturday, we played a doubleheader, and... Uh, and man, it was rough. We lost the first game like 12 to zero. <laughs> In the second game, we lost like eight to four or something like that. But you know what we did? We played every kid, it was the last game of the season, last day of the season, we played every kid who wanted to pitch. It's a rec league, you know, we're not, we're not training for college or anything here. It's just, it's just we're having fun. This is, very, this is like Sandlot. We don't do Sandlot baseball anymore because there's no Sandlots anymore. This is like Sandlot baseball. Uh, and so we went out there and pitched kids who had never pitched before, and would, they were, Judah's the catcher, flinging it over his head so much he's jumping up and it's hitting the backstop, he can't catch the ball. It was a mess. It was crazy. And uh, kids who'd never pitched, who didn't know how to pitch, were getting run ruled every inning. <laughs> it's like mercy ruled every single inning. Six runs, go sit down. Six runs, go sit down. It's terrible. And the kids had a blast. They had a blast. You know why? Because it was the end of the season, and they were so much better at the end of the season. There were guys hitting the ball, making connection with the ball that did not know how to swing about at the, end, the beginning of the year. And there were guys standing on the mound who were too scared to do that at the beginning of the year. And at the end of the year, they were standing on the mound and throwing pitches in front of a whole crowd of their family. Did they lose? Terribly. <laughs> And I'm not talking about participation trophies. I'm talking about looking back on that day and saying, man, I'm really thankful for a chance to come out here and be able, it's a beautiful sunny day here, to be able to spend some time with the kids and have some fun and throw a baseball around. Man, what do you, what do you want, you know? What do you want? I know a lot of times what's happening with youth sports is that parents are getting so obsessed with it that if their kid's not winning every game, they're mad and screaming and slamming the stuff down and how could you, and screaming to the umps and screaming, hey, settle down. Their kid's growing, their kid's learning, their kid's having fun. They're, they're, they're making some progress. And can you, can you just be thankful for that opportunity to be able to do that, you know? Brother Rex is over here saying, you know what I'm talking about, he's been an umpire, a referee, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's, can we just be thankful for that? Can you leave on a Sunday evening and go home and pray and say, God, I know I've got some things to work on. I know that you've convicted me and thank you so much for convicting me about these things, but thank you that, that you're teaching me, and thank you for growing me, and thank you that I've been enriched by your words, what, is, what it says here, for the enrichment of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for what you've done in my life. Thank you for the growth. Thank you for the second chance, and the third chance, and the fourth chance, and the millionth chance, and thank you, God, for it. 
the thankfulness helps you from being de feeling defeated when you are defeated. Amen. I mean, you are defeated, right? Yeah, sure. You know what we did this week? As far as being a good, holy Christian, we lost 8-0. to zero. What, 7 days? 7-0. to zero. We lost 7-0, to zero, all of us. Didn't we? Yeah. Any day you went out and lived the victorious Christian life? <laughs> no. 0-7 to seven was the score for this week. Worse than the Corinthians? They're a mess too. And Paul still says, I thank God for how he's grown you. I thank God for how he's enriched you. And I thank God for this. And I thank God. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. It goes along with what preacher is preaching about. Finding something to be thankful for. There is something to be thankful for. Thankful for God growing you in spite of the mess. Amen. Amen. All right, let's uh, skip down here. Romans chapter number one. I just have two more and then we'll be done. Romans chapter number one. Thankfulness, you know, it's, a, it's, look at verse number 10, Romans 1, 10, making request, here's Paul's prayer, verse number 9, without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, verse 10, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you, unto you, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. And then we won't turn there for sake of time, but in Philemon Verse number six, he says something similar here, and that is he's praying for the opportunity to preach. He's praying for the opportunity to give, praying for the opportunity for aid. Do you see this? To depart a spiritual gift, um, praying, for an op praying that it'll be effective, um, praying that it'll be a testimony of what God has done in the Romans, in the, in the Roman church, and the same he says with Philemon. Okay, so one thing that you can be praying for is praying for opportunities to aid others, praying for opportunities to give, praying for opportunities to whatever God has given you to, that you can be generous and give to somebody else, praying that God will use it for his purpose. You know, we joke around here about Brother Chase praying for the offering, right? Well, whether Brother Chase, you know, you got to pray in order to have a good offering or whatever. We, you know, we're joking about that, right? <laughs> That's a joke because y'all are, y'all are given what you're given. He's not praying and saying, God, will you please make them give something they didn't want to? <laughs> what does he pray? He says, God, I pray you'll take this gift, this aid, this offering that they're about to drop in the plate, sacrifice. I mean, it's going to come right out of your bank account. Money you had, you don't have no more. And I pray that you will take this money and do something with it. I pray you'll do something good with it. And it'll be effective. It'll be effectual, he says. I pray that it'll open doors. I pray that it'll do something. I thank God for a church that we can give through. You know, there's a lot of charities. The charities do great work and all that stuff. But have you ever seen how a lot of charities, you give them a dollar and like 10 cents of it goes to the person that you want? You know, you're going through the, the, the grocery store and they say, would you like to give, you know, would you like to round up for teachers, school teachers? And you feel guilty saying no, but at the same time, you're like, I'm going to give you a dollar and they're going to get like, one pencil or something, you know? It's, it doesn't feel like a lot of it's going to the people that you're trying to give it to, right? Yet when we have a church, think about what God gives us with a church. And this is not about giving. I'm, give, I'm telling you exactly what Paul says here. I'm not going to not talk about giving because, you know, I don't, you know, whatever. But we, we had a missionary come through here, the Andersons, and their son, um, William Anderson, this is a blessing, right? So their son said, you know what he does? He takes money directly, like PayPal, directly to this fund that he's put up. And he takes that money and he says, I think it's like $35, $30 or $19 or about 30 something dollars, right? He says, for every $30 that we get in this account, I can make a bag. It's like a gift bag. It's got supplies, medical supplies. They're in Papua New Guinea, by the way. And you all saw the, the hospitals that are over there. And he says, for every 30 bucks, I can get a bag and take it to someone who is in the hospital at Pop in Papua New Guinea. Give them some food, give them some, because the, the hospitals don't have anything. They, they only have food if their family brings it to them. They only have supplies if their family brings it to them. So they, he, this, this young man that was standing in our church is flying over to Papua New Guinea right now and will take any money that goes into that PayPal account and buy stuff with it and hand it to people who need it, along with the Bible, along with the gospel track, right. along with the witness. 
that's a good return on your money. I mean, that is a direct, given 30 bucks and 30 bucks lands where you wanted it to land. That is a blessing. That's what God does through a church and the opportunity that he gives through a church. Talk about cutting out the administrative middleman. I mean, that is a blessing that we're able to do that. Those missionaries you see on that back wall there, you give them money, those people are standing on the street witnessing to people. They are giving the gospel to people. It's not give a dollar and a dime gets there. What a blessing. So we ought to be praying, you know, along with your offering. It's real easy just to turn on like an auto pay thing and your tithe goes out automatically. Hey, when Brother Chase prays, you pray too. Pray, God, what we're given right now, will you please make it effective? Will you please make it land where it needs to land? We buy, spend some of that money to buy a camera and the gospel goes out to who knows who on the internet or wherever. God, will you please let that message land where, it, where it'll be effective? Amen. That's a blessing. Because it's not for nothing. You work hard for that money. You don't want to throw it in the plate and see the thing disappear. Okay, we'll pray the Holy Spirit will take that and we'll use it and we'll get some good out of it. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, one more. First Thessalonians, I believe it is. First, uh, Second Thessalonians. Chapter number one. Second Thessalonians, and so, you know, you can continue this study on your own, seeing how Paul is praying for these people, but it, to me it was just a blessing as we're going through Philippians to be able to study this out and learn from him about the different types of prayers. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter number 1, look at verse number 7. This is related to that holiness thing we talked about earlier. Verse number 7, great passage here, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. These are people that are they're, they're, they're being persecuted. They're having difficulty. They've got family members um, dying. They're expecting the Lord to come back, and people are dying. They're wondering what's going on. Verse 70 says, To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power, when he shall come, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore, and I read that first because he says wherefore, so you got to look backwards to see what he's talking about. Verse number 11, wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. So he says, this suffering that you're going through, we're praying um, that God would count you worthy of this suffering. The struggle, that is, that you're going through. The suffering, whatever suffering it is, losing loved ones or struggling with your money or struggling to be a good Christian or whatever it is, struggle just to be, what it, just the struggle that you're going through and you're saying, God, you know, help me through this struggle. Part of that struggle is God drawing you close to him in prayer and getting you closer to him in that struggle so that your walk can be worthy of the struggle and worthy of the problems that you're facing there. It goes hand in hand with holiness because we struggle with God over the things that we suffer. When you have trouble, it drives you to God. Yes. And that... that being driven to God causes us to be more like him and want to be, to, to be worthy of that suffering. Say, God, use this. I don't want this suffering that we're going through to be for no reason or in vain. God, use this for your glory somehow. Use this for your glory. Sometimes that suffering, um, you know, preacher preached this morning about being thankful for suffering. How are, you, how are you thankful for suffering? How are you thankful for that suffering? Maybe it's part of what that is, is, is how is the Lord going to use this? I, I, he'll use it differently in everybody's life. If five people in here lose a loved one, lost a loved one last year, and five more lose a loved one this year, God will use it differently to grow each one of us. But there's one thing he will do for all of us in that suffering, and that is he will draw us closer to him. If you'll let that suffering draw you to him in prayer 
and to having those times with God and saying, God, I want to talk to you about this, and will you help me with this grief? Will you help me with this pain? Will you help me with this struggling? If you'll let God drive you to prayer in that, then you'll end up being more like him as a result of those conversations with God and that alone time with God. You'll just be, sometimes God wants to talk to you. I'm not saying that he does something, you know, terrible in your life just for the sake of talking to you. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, as bad things happen and man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward, as, as bad things happen, one of the ways that God uses that for good is helping you to have some conversations with him and have some prayer with him as a result of it. Amen? Amen. I, I, I love, like I said, I love playing baseball with Judah. We'd go out there and play catch. Go in the backyard and play catch. And you all play catch with your dad when you were a little kid. And I'm not out there just trying to teach him how to throw a ball harder because I want him to go to college or play. So none of that. You know what I want to do when I'm going out there and playing catch with him? I just want to have a conversation with him. Just a dad, and I want to throw a ball with him and talk to my son. Amen? Amen. And it may be tough with him, and I may say, okay, do this and do that, kind of this and that and this and that. But that this and that is less, it's a lot less important than this and that. Sure. And that may be part of what God is doing uh, with this prayer. Maybe all of these other things will fade away, and when we get home to heaven, the, these, the, the things that we have, or, that we're struggling with now will fade and will, will be very dim. But that relationship that we built, that, that God used these things to build that relationship, will last throughout eternity. And so those are just some things to be thinking about as we're, uh, as we're looking at how Paul...